Hello there, welcome to Brussels, my love, Euronews' weekly talk show that takes a look at all the news brewing in Brussels and beyond. I'm Maeve McMahon, thanks for joining us. Coming up this week, it's the winter of discontent for European farmers. This week, tractor protests blocked key roads all across Belgium and France, causing chaos for commuters. Furious with low incomes and wary of free trade deals that could impact their business, farmers look to Brussels for answers. And EU leaders were here in Brussels this week for a key meeting on the future of Ukraine. But it was not the only summit in town. For the first time ever, a huge conference took place to improve the rights of our furry friends. Organised by the Belgian Presidency, the gathering examined commission updates to animal welfare laws. We take a look at what could improve for millions of animals here in Europe. With our guests this week, Fabrizio Rossi, Secretary General of the Council of European Municipalities and Regions, Tilly Metz, Green MEP from Luxembourg, Hello. and Gerardo Fortuna, Euronews' very own senior policy reporter covering food and health. Hi, Maeve. Welcome. Lovely to see you all. Um, thanks for joining us. But before we bring in your analysis, let's just first remind our viewers about the ongoing bun fight between farmers and policymakers. Another week, another show of anger from European farmers. Bales of hay and colourful tractors blocked major roadways around Paris. And tractors all across Belgium caused delays during rush hour. Farmers say they want more money in their pocket, less environmental restrictions and more protection against cheap imports. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has opened talks with farmers to listen to their concerns. And EU agricultural subsidies do allocate big bucks to the sector. But with the distribution of wealth and profits deemed disproportionate, all eyes are on Brussels to calm the blaze and not add fuel to the fire. Incredible pictures there. The farmers do know how to stage a protest. And this week, during the EU summit in Brussels, they managed to cause chaos and a lot of destruction as well across the EU uh, quarter. But look, we've seen these protests for the last couple of weeks. They started in Germany, then they spread all across. Is there a common thread, Gerardo, to these protests? I mean, I imagine that you saw them coming. Yeah, we can um, we can say that there are two kinds of protests, like two waves. The first wave was a was trying to address a specific problem. You mentioned the German farmers uh, before. La last year there was some protests in the Netherlands as well where Dutch farmers were complaining about uh, the uh, nitrogen emissions directive and now the Germans were protesting about a, a, a tax break on, uh, on diesel. But uh, what's happening now that this second wave uh, started in France actually, uh, we can call them some kind of everywhere, everything, everything everywhere, all at once, uh, protests, because they were trying to address environmental uh, issues, uh, uh, the, the, the raising burden on farmers when it comes to cope with the uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, trade deals. The Mercosur uh, deal was one of the uh, main, uh, yeah. I mean, t the farmers were trying to to asking the, the government to cope with that. And that's why um, President Emmanuel Macron came early this week to Brussels to have meetings about that very... Indeed. Indeed, trade deal. But he was also criticising uh, Brussels and the policies from Brussels where he got a lot of criticism then till he met from a number of politicians here saying that that wasn't fair to blame Brussels for everything. But indeed, all roads have led to Brussels. We've seen the farmers gather outside your own very door of the mm -hmm. European Parliament. Yes, should they not have been listened to perhaps a little bit earlier? I know the Commission has a dialogue now, but is it not too little too late for these farmers? Yes, indeed. Mrs. von der Leyen came now recently. She said we need a constructive dialogue with the farmers. Of course, it would have been needed much, much earlier. And I think the, the main problem is the common agricultural policy. I mean, we have there a huge instrument of orientation, how we want agriculture to be, and we don't use it the right way. So we definitely need a paradigm shift regarding the common agricultural policy. And the only ones that are saying that since decades are the Greens. We did not vote in favour of a common agricultural policy that put farmers into dependency towards subsidies, mm. that put farmers... If you look also 
where this money of the common agricultural policy, you see that 80% of this money, and it's really one third nearly of the EU budget that we are speaking about, goes only to 20% of the farmers. farmers. And mostly so the big farmers, so the small farmers really are feeling... an unfair system that we farm. need to change Time in order to, change. to give dignity back to the farmers. What's your take, Fabrizio, on all this? Look, uh, working here in Brussels is not always uh, easy to connect directly with farmers. So yesterday, you know, I felt really I couldn't miss this opportunity to speak with those farmers that were prost protesting and demonstrating just down our building. And I've been speaking with them and I heard mainly like two messages, I would say. First message is we are fighting against uh, unfair competition from outside the EU, exactly. first message. Mm -hmm. Second message was, mm -hmm. we have the feeling that in Brussels nobody cares about farmers. Now, this is not just worrying, this is really a wake-up call for all of us. Mm -hmm. I think that, of course, the discussion is now on the common agricultural policy, what we, we really lack a clear vision for farming. Mm -hmm. Do we want farmers in the future? And what's the vision for rural development? Yeah. Our policies very often focus on urban areas. If people living in rural areas, yes. they feel... And we're seeing that clash. Time. We see that all across the continent, from Warsaw to Dublin. Um, just to, on that note, we did, Fabrizio, invite farmers around the table with us here, but to no avail. But we did catch up with them on the Belgian motorway to ask them what they hope to achieve. Take a listen. Why are we here? To express that we are fed up with the agricultural measures that have been taken, the administrative and the environmental measures. We reviewed the cap, we review it every now and then, but at some point the measures that were taken, we feel they were decided by people who have never been in the field, who have never seen the reality of the agricultural world. We just want to ask for relaxation of the rules and for logic. We want more rational ideas for our profession and way less constraints. Does he have a point there that, you know, this legislation has been drafted by bureaucrats who are not in touch with the life of a farmer? I mean, it's a very tough job out in the cold all day and they just can't handle all this red tape. It's a very interesting take because uh, I think we all agree here around this table that uh, Fabrizio mentioned before, but, but also Tilly, uh, we need a new vision. Uh, if you think about the way the Commission has tried to cope with the, this protest, uh, trying to lend a helping hand to Macron, uh, coping with French farmers, uh, is to is like a tiny change in the common agricultural policy, relaxing, uh, loosening the, this green measure when it comes to uh, fallow land. Uh, it's it's not that much. It's uh, um, and also this is also cu curious because farmers are complaining about red tape. Uh, this uh, relaxation of, uh, of measure is going to create other red tape because farmers now have to uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, the crops that are planting, it's uh, nitrogen fixing crop or catch crops. Mm. Uh, so in order to get this uh, uh, relaxation. So uh, you're not going to sort the, the issue out with just cosmetic chains or specific it needs tweaks. reform. And one thing all the farmers have in common, regardless where they're from, is their frustration mm -hmm. uh, with Brussels. We can bring in another uh, farmer representative there, Luke Vernet from Farm Europe. This anger seen from Brussels was fairly predictable given the political choices that have been made and the geopolitical context surrounding European agriculture. A number of problems come from Brussels, but the solutions will also come from Brussels. And that's the paradox of the situation. Farmers are the first Europeans. They know what they owe to the common agricultural policy. And there is a need to rediscover an ambition and an economic dimension and to chart a course that takes into account both economic and environmental performance. Not one against the other, one and the other. Pas l'un contre l'autre, l'un et l'autre. So as you can hear there, the problems come from Brussels, but the solutions also a lot of pressure on people like yourself, on lawmakers. Yes, of course, there's a lot of pressure, but I must say, I understand the fed up of the farmers. I see it really as a movement of liberation from coming from the farmers. They don't want dependency on EU subsidies. They want to be paid for their products. They don't want the threats coming from cheap imports where there is, an, and it was said, an unfair competition. How can you compete with products that don't have the same standards on environment, on animal welfare? So this is an, an, an impossible uh, win to take there. And 
I always say the ecologists and the farmers, at the end of the day, we have the same fights. We also need to fight against climate change because if we want to keep up agriculture at the mid and long term, we need healthy soils. We need to fight the droughts. That's everything the farmers have to fight with. But without the farmers, no, no food. But without nature, also no agriculture. Well, one would question as well why you have the cap, for example, on one hand, and then on the other hand you have the Green Deal. Would it not work better to have all these policies in the same um, chapter, in the same, might make life easier and less confusing. But just regarding um, the EU Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, you mentioned earlier that she did give a nod to farmers this week, uh, taking to, to Twitter to say that in hardship we find common solutions. And she did propose a one-year derogation from cap rules on fallow lands. What exactly will this mean? Will this alleviate pressure? First of all, it's uh, it's a partial derogation. So there was already a similar derogation on the same, uh, uh, this is called GAEC, Good, Ag Good Agricultural Environmental Practices. So uh, in order to get the EU funds, farmers need to, uh, are required to uh, do this kind of good agricultural uh, practices. Uh, this is the number eight, there are nine of them. And this one is related to setting aside part of their arable land to um, landscape feature or non-productive areas. So basically, uh, fallow land just to uh, increase the, the quantity, the level of biodiversity in... Uh... Fabrizio, was this a good idea? And what would you do if you were the Commission President? Look, first of all, I think we should be really fair with the European Commission. Um, the European Commission proposal on the cap was actually progressive some years ago and they tried really to put forward some uh, interesting proposals. At the end the question is who is deciding here in Brussels? The European Council is integrated by representatives from national governments and at the end you know somehow what makes the news is always Brussels. The anger is always going and directed towards Brussels but you know, who is taking the decision here? At the end, representatives from national governments should take responsibility because they are deciding here in Brussels. Well, just on the common agri agricultural policy known as CAP, uh, you've mentioned it as well, but just in case our viewers are not familiar with it, it came about back in '62 to provide affordable and safe food to Europeans and guarantee farmers a decent standard of living. And it was reformed recently to give money and incentives to farmers for environmentally friendly farming. And its budget is 386.6 billion euros. Is there a real conversation, Tilly Metz, happening right now to reform that cap and make it fit for purpose? Because look how old it is. Exactly, you mentioned the, the, the right uh, points here. I think what would be very important and as soon as possible, as I said, to make really a paradigm shift and not to stay into the logic, the more surfaces, hectare you have, the more money you get. Because that is only in favor of the big pharma industry, um, um, farmers industry, of the big companies of and not of the small farmers and it's that that we need to support every day thousand farmers small company uh, disappear so that's what we need to to tackle and i think we need to also to address the right enemies and i said it already and that is the dependency on fixing the price for example is fixed by the big retailers by the multinationals we need to address also the dependency on the big uh, chemical companies agrochemical companies that are dependency we need to stop so that is what we need to, to rethink the system System and that it is fairer uh, towards the f all the farmers. Because, of course, over in France, I mean, the Olympics are taking place, Fabrizio, in a couple of months. And, I mean, the government there does not want to see these farmers out on the streets causing chaos until then. Of course, I mean, this is understandable. Um, we understand uh, that uh, this, is, uh, this is a problem on uh, Macron's agenda. Yet, of course, this is coming too late. Uh, now, of course, uh, the focus is on uh, this commercial trade with uh, Mercosur. And uh, yet, you know, this is a trade that has been in discussion for over 10 years, maybe even 20 years, right? And uh, of course, now the focus is on this unfair competition, but this should have been the core of the agenda since the very beginning in the discussion with, this, uh, uh, with our counterparts in the Mercosur. 
but it wasn't the case. I mean, it wasn't the case also because this is the essential internal fight in Brussels. So uh, the clashes between two different policies. Here we have the trade policy and so the objectives of having a reliable partner and, so, and also giving in some, some aspects. And sometimes farmers have been offered on a plate uh, in order to appease trade, part trade partners. They've been the bargaining chip. Basically, basically, we've seen. I mean, also because, for instance, when you when you discuss trade deals, it's all it's always about GIs, for instance, geographical indications. So uh, recognize it's also leverage, you know, uh, in order to convince trade partners to strike a deal. And that's why they made so much noise this week and really crashed that party, that EU summit. But we wanted to bring in another view from a union, in fact, and we spoke to Enrico Somnalia. He is the deputy general secretary of the European Federation of Food, Agriculture, and Tourism Trade Unions. We share uh, some of the farmers' concerns. Uh, we understand uh, the pressure we are facing, in particular from uh, unfair competition from third countries. Uh, and we also understand that, particularly for small farmers, uh, they still get a very small uh, uh, income for their activities. But at the same time, we have a clear message. The main problem uh, of the agriculture sector is not the farm to fork strategy, is not uh, the EU environmental ambition. The main issue is the unfair distribution of wealth uh, across the food chain. And this is something that we don't see enough in these farmers' protests, and this is the real problem that affects in particular small farmers and agricultural workers even more. Enrico Somalia there, I can see you're all nodding your head along with what you've heard there. Absolutely. I mean, this is the, the, the central point mm -hmm. here. Um, I mean, we can engage in trade uh, um, uh, agreements with other regions um, from other states across the globe. This makes sense as far as we are able really to mutualize the profit that we generate through these commercial agreements. And we are falling short on this because farmers, they really feel that they are the losers of this economic integration. And that's why they were so angry. We saw that chaos on the borders as well this week. Tilly Metz with French farmers actually taking the merchandise from Spanish lorries and tipping it all over. Mm -hmm. I mean, causing chaos. They really want their voice to be heard. And I imagine, Tilly Metz, that this issue could also play a big role in the European elections coming up in June. Yeah, it's a key, I mean, uh, food safety, uh, the issue of the farmers, it's a key issue. What we eat is a key issue. Uh, how healthy it is, healthy nutrition is one of the key concerns of the European citizens. So it's just a pity that we didn't really take it serious and make a coherent politic there. Uh, we spoke about the farm to fork strategy, which is much more progressive, but the common agricultural policy is not coherent to this farm to fork uh, strategy. So we need now uh, coherent politicians that really tackle the right enemies and not speaking about this um, this 4% uh, follow land, uh, not productive land, we need really to make an impact assessment. What would it really bring? Because this land, this 4%, is also very important for biodiversity, for the bees, etc. So does it really bring the expected uh, winds that we say there? I don't think so. Let's tackle the real problem at the, at the core, at the racin, at the roots. At the roots. And Gerardo, that farm to fork strategy, yeah. would you just remind our viewers what it is and how it also got a little bit pushed down the agenda of the Commission? Yeah, indeed. The farm to fork strategy was um, is the agri food portion of the Green Deal. It was presented in uh, 2020 and uh, aims at uh, giving uh, a green direction to farming. As uh, Tilly was mentioning, there was a bit this debate about scrapping the common agricultural policy, scrapping the cap, it was something that... The what we should scrapping. have done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there was this window of opportunity of having a new food policy and uh, um, and reforming also the, the common agricultural policy while we um, uh, we accepted the version proposed by the, the previous agricultural commissioner, Phil Hogan, and was uh, basically transposed to, to the current legislative mandate. In, in, there might have been a, a good window of opportunity to uh, also embrace this change. I, I have an, on, an unorthodox view on uh, the possibility to bring change to common agricultural policy, which is um, the perspective of having Ukraine. It's not going to happen soon, we know that. It's not going to happen in the next uh, programming period starting in 2028, but the next CAP talks will start uh, having Ukraine in the discussion. And I still think that Ukraine could be quite important because it could bring... Uh, 
uh, the talks toward a reform of commercial policy because, first of all, direct payments uh, are done at the moment by actors. And if you have to extend the same aid to Ukraine farmers, mm. whose average is 500 hectares... That's a uh, fascinating yeah. conversation, but we have to keep it for <laughs> another day because I'm afraid we have run out of time. But thank you so much to our guests. And you don't go anywhere because after the break, we'll be hearing about EU plans to update animal welfare rules. See you soon. Welcome back to Brussels, my love, I'm Maeve McMahon. Now, this week, the biggest news story here was, of course, the EU summit. You've seen coverage all across Euronews and Euronews.com. But what we want to focus on here is the big gathering on animal welfare that took place on Tuesday. Among the participants were Reinike Hamelers. She's the head of the organisation Eurogroup for Animals. We asked her if she was impressed with the outcome and what could change for animals here in Europe. The EU likes to pride itself as global leader um, on animal welfare and for a long time that was also uh, the case. But we must say that promises are not being followed now. So it's very important that the Commission and other institutions are taking that uh, responsibility more seriously because the current legislation is very uh, outdated. We have seen so many scandals, you know. In the 21st century we are still shipping and transporting these animals, you know, for hours on end and citizens want this to be stopped. Now, the Commission has introduced a new proposal on this, but that's not ambitious enough. Reinike Hamler is there on the lack of ambition, according to her, in the EU plans. So I guess we're wondering, why has the Commission been so reluctant to move here? Is it perhaps due to pressure from agricultural lobbying or worries that these changes could increase the cost of food for us, Gerardo? I, would, I think it was also about the timing because the um, the proposal for animal welfare rules came very late in the legislative mandate and very close to the election. So uh, there was the initiative at the end of the KJ that uh, farmers don't look particularly good at and, uh, and this uh, prevented the Commission to have an ambitious stance and in the end they adopted this package in December but was was quite disappointing both from for the lawmaker side, for the activists, uh, also for NGOs, uh, because they did uh, it didn't have the the aspect uh, related to animal animal welfare in farmed animals. That was Tilly Metz, Is that because it's just not a priority for the EU right now with all that's going on, with wars all around, with migration, mm -hmm. everything else? Yeah, but it's all somehow also linked. I mean, it's about also uh, about the agricultural system uh, the, that we have, the agricultural model that we have. I must say, at the beginning of this legislative period, I was so optimistic uh, because we had, first time I had the honour to be the chair of the inquiry committee on the protection of animals during transport. We had uh, really a resolution also on animal in science. We had foreseen in the farm to fork strategy the revision of four important uh, legislation on animal welfare regarding slaughtering, labelling, uh, the rearing and breeding, and also the animal in transport. Now, what came out very late, too late in order to finish it, is a proposal which is, as Reinike Hamler said, too weak uh, on, on the rules that are proposed there, and the three others on slaughtering, on breeding, though, and the cage age, that was a great. Uh, huge movement from citizens that don't want animals to be kept in these small cages. Still near the half of the poultry mm -hmm. is in small cages, the rabbits, etc. So it's also about the credibility of the EU institutions, the fact that we didn't deliver here. And this is a huge topic for our viewers, for Europeans. If you just take a look at any Eurobarometer polls on this, 9 out of 10 are calling on their governments and on the EU to do more. And just on that proposal that came out before December, uh, we just jotted down a few points that it uh, suggested. Shorter transport times, for example, for animals, especially pregnant animals and, and small calves. Minimum space for all animals. Minimum standards, as you said. But I mean, this all looks great on paper. This still needs to get implemented and we don't even know when it could. Absolutely. And I understand citizens have high expectations on this. Everybody understands that uh, we are not just talking about uh, uh, animal welfare here. I mean, this is strictly connected to environmental protection and to human health. Mm -hmm. So it's really about this mm -hmm. triangle. This is why we really need to apply an holistic approach in the way we really okay. deal with this issue. And citizens, they do understand this. Until they have, I guess, a crisis in the room, no? With a, a scandal, yeah. or a food scare, 
or a horse meat um, problem. From South America, indeed. This is also partially linked to the trade deals that we were discussing before. Mm. There was also um, this aspect of uh, mirror clauses, so basically having reciprocity when it comes to the imports of food uh, from uh, from outside the Europe. And uh, this, is, this is also a burden on farmers as well, because uh, it was mentioned by Tilly, Tilly before, farm, European farmers uh, have to comply with very strict rules when, it, rules when it comes to food safety and this is not the same for, uh, for farmers from other countries. And is there a change of tune, do you think, around farmers now that it's time to like, take a more holistic, mindful look at how they've been farming and how they treat animals? I think the problem is not on the farmer's side. I mean, they need the, the right support. They need the council, financial support, human resource in order to do so. But it's not there the problem. They are not happy if they see their animals uh, being on, on ships, on vessels during three months, suffering and being thrown over the board uh, in, into the sea. So they don't like to see that. So I think the, there there is the will to do the step. But of course, they need the right support. And again, we could have a great instrument of orientation with the common agricultural policy and the money that is involved in that. But we are not doing so. And I think really the citizens, if you look at the Eurobarometer, it's one of the topics where the citizens are the most sensitive about. People are also fed up with, not, or with the, how we treat the animals. And then, as you said very rightly, it's also in the concept of One Health. We are coming out of a pandemic. Zoonoses are also spreading more and more. And this is also linked to the way we treat animals and also white animals. And is this a concern you're hearing as well from your members all across rural Europe? Absolutely. They are very concerned about, uh, about this topic because, uh, well, first of all, we, they do speak with farmers almost on an everyday basis. You know, a mayor in a rural area speak with farmers uh, almost on almost every day. So they know actually what are the issues. So we should probably hear more from uh, local elected politicians because they do touch the problem with their own hands. And when we speak with mayors, indeed, we understand that farming and uh, the issue with farming is, is, is not just about the way we treat the animals. You know, for many years we've been pushing farmers to produce more mm -hmm. by also at the same time cutting costs. Mm -hmm. So we have been really pushing them towards this model. And now suddenly we ask them to change completely mm -hmm. the way they grew their, their, their animals. So this is uh, just... Uh, Difficult if I may say, it was even the young farmers in Luxembourg that said very clearly we need to stop the export of live animals outside the EU. So there we have definitely the support. But it's like you say, we push the farmers into a system that is really, that puts a lot of pressure. They don't have anything to say on the prices on their products. It's the big retailers that say, no, you have, we don't give you so much money for that. Hence, it's hence the frustration among farmers all across yeah. and why we've seen those images all across Brussels as well this week but I'm afraid that is all we have time for on that topic of animal welfare we will keep you updated as those proposals um, continue to be discussed but for now thank you so much to our guests and thank you for watching stay with us here on Euronews Welcome back to Brussels My Love Euronews' weekend talk show I'm Maeve McMahon and along with Tilly Metz, Fabrizio Rossi and Gerardo Fortuna, we're talking through the news of the week here in Brussels. And one story that got us talking was the EU Council President's political U-turn. Just a few weeks ago, Charles Michel said he'd be stepping aside early to run for office as MEP. But this week, just ahead of that summit, he changed his mind and said he would stay in a seat as President of the EU Council until the end of November. He took to Facebook to make sure that he could be heard loud and clear, saying that I had foreseen some media attention, given the unprecedented, some would say bold nature of my approach, but to maintain the focus of my mission, I will not be a candidate. I think there he's saying he didn't expect so much, perhaps, media attention, Fabrizio. What's your take on all this? Well, I mean, he has a fair important job. So, of course, uh, the media are focusing on uh, his decision on what he says. Look, um, I mean, leadership is also, I mean, what we expect from our, uh, from our politicians. And now is also a very trending topic, right? Uh, leadership. We often speak about the qualities of a good leader. Mm. Well, a good leader is, first of all, someone that really dedicates himself, herself to the cause. 
Mm-hmm. That fight the mission, yeah. and you when the personal agenda How took people, over, what, did, what was the word in the political corridors of the parliament about this? Of course, we were not happy about this move. I mean, you have a responsibility; you committed to a cause, exactly. And then you say, "Oh, but now I have to think of my career." I, I don't understand why he said that was bold, but bold, that's another, I, I, need, I need to ask him. But for me, you have committed to a responsibility and you should do it until this mission ends and not uh, thinking of other. I mean, that is clear and we need politicians that are clear leadership. I'm minister, as far, just an example, minister, I think, comes from Latin and say, at the service of the population. And that's something we need to remind here. Plus, you, you in the parliament were happy... You don't have to deal with him uh, in the next turn, no, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm all the same. <laughs> to hear another view on what takes a good European leader, like what you mentioned, we spoke to Stephen Everts. He's the director of the EU Institute for Security Studies, watching EU decision-making for decades. Take a look. We need somebody, maybe, that can speak for Europe, that can really you know, articulate what it is that Europe stands for, what it is that we want, what the red lines are, the things that we cannot accept, and we don't need a small... Uh, European Council President. We need a big European Council President. We have this logic in, in the EU. We need a socialist here. You need a, a Christian Democrat there. Then you meet perhaps a liberal over there. North, South, East, West, man, woman, what have you. I think this is too important for that. We should not exclude people who perhaps don't have a party family behind them, but who could fit the job very well. Stephen Everett's there. I mean, I guess the question is, are we getting tripped up, perhaps, uh, Gerardo, by our political correctness here in the EU? I mean, we tend to forget the fact that in Brussels, the real uh, fight is interinstitutional rather than political. Uh, even between the many presidents that the EU has. I mean, let's not forget the fact that the first uh, uh, president uh, going to Kiev was Roberto Mazzola. Was Roberto Mazzola. President of the European Parliament. So there's also there's an internal competition on who going to represent Europe. And this is something that, uh, for instance, Charles Michel during this mandate didn't really prove to be good at, in a sense. Uh, he, he suffered a lot, the, um, the, the, for instance, the, the comes attempts by Roberto Mezzola, but even Ursula von der Leyen. So just briefly, has he lost all his credibility? Look, let's put it this way. Um, when uh, the personal agenda take precedence on the mission, on the cause, then the leader fails. Very to the point there, <laughs> very to the point and a very <laughs> good answer there from so Fabrizio well. Rossi. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. I wish oh. we could talk about that for much longer because it's obviously a topic that fascinates me and must confuse, I'm sure, our viewers because indeed there's a lot of yeah. presidents in this town, a lot of people with fancy titles um, and a lot to do. <laughs> but anyway, we'll come back to that. Thank you so much to our guests Thanks. for being thank with you. us. Pleasure to have you and thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to reach out on any of the topics you've heard about today, you can write to us. Our email is brusselsmylove at euronews.com. We're also on social media, Instagram, LinkedIn and X. See you soon on Euronews.